Warning, the following video contains explicit language which may be offensive to some viewers or inappropriate for children. The content within this video is intended for mature audiences only. Hello and welcome to this part three of episode two of season one of Rabbits. Um, Cernicus Jones. Um, we are going to pretty much pick up what we had, where we left off at, but before we get into it, I'm going to go ahead and use, give you my usual disclaimer of, I do not do this for money, this channel is not monetized, I do it for pure sharing of something that I'm really into right now. Um, Hope you enjoy it. Also, if you want to feed the YouTube algorithm and subscribe, give a like, and do the whole bell thing, that's cool too. But because this channel is not, is not monetized, the only real value is that it feeds the algorithm and throws the video out to more people. So, without further ado, let's go. I agreed and set up our intervention under the guise of a dinner. The three of us used to eat together all the time, so there was no reason she would suspect anything. Yumiko, however, never made it to that dinner. And that, my friends, is one of the the things that this that in a way his podcast kind of reminds me of Stephen King's writing just the way he introduces characters builds them up gives you your backstory and stuff I really get the feeling mind you this is all conjecture for me that I think the writers or whoever the head writer is for this did a fantastic job and has probably read Stephen King's on writing. She was gone. After waiting an hour for her to show up, Adam and I drove over to Miko's place. Her front door was wide open. Her laptop and some money were out in the open, sitting on her desk. We called the police, but they seemed to believe she was just another millennial rebelling against her stern Asian parents. They weren't willing or able to declare Yumiko missing for 24 hours. See that, I think at the time that this was, that this is set in, that the whole 24 hour waiting period before declaring someone a missing person was a thing. But I don't believe, at least I know in where I live, that it is if it's a, if it's a parent or a sibling or something it, it I think it automatic it almost automatically calls for action so after explaining that Yumiko was American not Japanese I yelled at them to dust for prints to search for evidence but they weren't nearly as concerned as I was even Adam who hadn't seen Miko in the state I'd seen her in believed she'd probably gone out and accidentally left the door open. Adam and I couldn't figure out her password, so he gave the police permission to take her laptop, and they agreed to tell us if they were able to dig up anything as soon as they were legally able to do so. We looked everywhere, but we couldn't find her phone. The next day, when Yumiko didn't show up, both Adam and the police came around to my way of thinking. But by then, we'd already lost 24 of the first 48 hours. That's kind of cool to the, the, it's 
kind of a reference to the show 48 hours that was on one of the extended cable channels I forget which one now um, but that's just kind of a really cool pop reference pop culture thing the time period law enforcement considers crucial as far as potential rescue and recovery Yumiko wasn't rescued or recovered in that time period, but I'm going to find my friend. I'm not giving up. For the first month after Yumiko's disappearance, Adam and I did nothing but put up posters and field phone calls and messages from a tip line I'd set up. See, I find that kind of funny because that's what people around where I live do with like lost dogs, lost cats. Um, and this is also the, the, before the inner, before the whole, or at least the time period this iteration of rabbits is set in. It's before the online bulletins, um, before posting missing persons on Facebook became a thing. It's just kind of cool. There were a lot of calls, but no solid leads. Right around this time, Adam's partner had a very serious health scare, and Adam spent most of his time after that in Bellingham with his husband, Marco, and I was left to go through all the calls on my own. Yumiko's parents flew back and forth to Japan. Yumiko's mother had become convinced by Yumiko's allegedly psychic aunt and I find that I find that bit interesting. Um, I've been to Washington State. I've been to Seattle. In fact, my mother's originally from Seattle. Um, and Seattle's a huge melting pot, but I've never lived there. And my experiences with the Asian culture in Southeast Texas, where I live, is they tend to not put so much sway into the psychics and stuff like that. A lot of them are still practicing Buddhists, but as far as the whole psychic thing, and I, I just wonder if that's like, artistic liberty or just something they needed to put in to further the story or why her parents weren't active in the story. Something terrible had befallen her daughter. Yumiko's mother was currently in Japan to consult a group of mystics her sister had assembled to help find Yumiko in the spirit realm and help guide her back. Yumiko's father went with his wife. She was in no condition to travel alone. That would be me. Um, regardless of my personal views, I tend to try to support my wife. Even if I don't understand or comprehend what she's doing, I do my best to try to support her. And I think that here kind of shows a, a decent, fi a decent fi family. I'm trying to say family. For some reason that was difficult family relationship or at least between the two parents they remained in constant communication with adam who was running point on everything here yumiko's mother was willing to try anything and i can't really blame her i suppose although i really wish they remained here in seattle I'd put up all the posters I possibly could, and calls on the tip line stopped coming in. I felt like I was wasting time. There had to be something else I could do to find my missing friend. That's when I spoke with producer Terry Miles about creating this podcast for the Public Radio Alliance. And I think I said this in other videos, but I'm going to say it again. So I like the fact that they use the real names. Um, if you go to the... Uh, Public Radio Alliance webpage. All the, the names like Carly Parker, 
um, Terry Miles, Nick Silver, and anything associated when it mentions somebody as working for PRA, that these are real people. And I, that's just, to me, that kind of furthers the immersion into the uh, world of rabbits. I'd been documenting my search for Yumiko from the beginning, but it was at this point that I decided to focus my energy on this show as a way of not only continuing to document my search for Yumiko, but perhaps more importantly, as a way of eliciting assistance, engaging the hive mind, a way of asking you, our listeners, for help. See, the first time I listened to this, it made me wonder, and I've thought about doing it because on the Rabbit's Podcast homepage, you can download these episodes. And, I, and I've been toying with the idea of going through and using a sound editor and break the layers apart and see if there's anything that the uh, producers of this podcast and stuff have weaved in behind under the music or mixed into the music or background noises aren't what exactly they sound like. It's just one of those things that that particular line in this episode being so early makes me wonder about the rest of the uh, series. The police didn't appear to have the motivation or the resources to dig into every aspect of Yumiko's life, but I did. So I started looking into everything I could, beginning with the mysterious something Yumiko had discovered hidden in the ancient computer game called Wizardry. Not sure if that's a real game or not. Just like Yumiko described, there was one working link that led to a strange personality test. It was weird. All kinds of curious moral dilemmas. Which, it's the funny thing, is when I come across stuff like that, just randomly browsing the internet, I usually take these tests because they amuse me um, to no end to do so. It's just one of those things that is just part of modern internet life, I guess. I quickly answered the five questions and waited. Nothing. I took the test again with slightly different answers. Still nothing. The third time through, I read over the questions in detail and did my very best to answer the strange questions as honestly as possible. This third set of answers resulted in my being emailed the torrent file link. I immediately downloaded the file which turned out to be that creepy video that appeared to have put Yumiko into some kind of weird hypnotic state. So, how to describe that video? I suppose the closest thing would be that creepy film within the film they showed in Ringu, or The Ring. It was a lot of grainy patterns and videotape tracking adjusted weirdness. Harper was way too freaked out to watch, but I made her watch me watch it. See, that right there shows some intelligence on the character. Yes, Carly Parker throughout the series is going to do some almost cliche, if not cliche, stupid moves. But for the most part, she is a fairly, you can rely on her for being a fairly intelligent character. To make sure I didn't pee myself or anything weird. The video wasn't very long. It was actually a loop. But, and this is where things get kind of weird. I could never find where the loop ended and restarted. I feel like it was different every time. And every time I missed it and realized I was seeing something I'd already seen, I felt... Strange, as if somebody was behind my eyes watching through me. Even with Harper there with me in the room, 
the whole experience was really unnerving. I've been considering posting that video to the notes section of our website, but after what happened to Yumiko, I'm not sure that's the most responsible thing to do. See, that right there is another bit of intelligence. The protagonist thinking out her decisions and basically looking down the road of unintended consequences. That's kind of cool. I wouldn't say that I'm a believer or an atheist. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, closer to agnostic, I suppose. But I'm beginning to wonder about whether or not I believe in something outside of our regular human experience. I'm beginning to wonder about a lot of things. While I was re-examining Yumiko's most recent emails to me for any clues, I received an instant message via cat chat, the strange application that I'd never actually installed. I still think if something like that showed up on my computer and I know I didn't install it or my wife didn't install it, I think that uh, I'd be freaked. I would be freaked out way beyond what Carly is. It was nothing but a question mark. I replied with a question mark of my own. A few minutes later, I received another message. Seven digits. What I assumed was a phone number. So I called the number. The voice on the other end was the man who calls himself Concernicus Jones. I need you to tell me everything you know about Yumiko. Who are you? Why are you doing this? What do you know? Just diving right in, are we? Where'd you get those photographs of Miko? I only sent you one photo. I found some more. How? I did a reverse image search. I found what appeared to be an abandoned website with a few more photos of the same person. Your friend? Looks like it. Well done. Do you have a tattoo of a dragon somewhere? Ha. Back to the photos of you, Miko. I found them because she kind of stepped in front of someone else. Literally? Metaphorically. What, someone else? Somebody I'd been following. Why were you following somebody? Because they were part of something. And this, and Concernicus, or Mr. Jones, let's use that, is a lot, plays this coy game with uh, Carly a whole lot. Okay, you're starting to sound more than a little conspiracy nut-esque. It gets better. We're just getting started. What do you mean, part of something? I mean, she was playing a part in a game. She was playing a game? Maybe. What do you mean? It's kind of complicated. Try me. Okay, well, the number of people who are actual players is very small. Okay, so? So it's more likely that your friend was playing a part in the game. What's the difference? She may have been simply playing a role. She was unaware she was playing. Okay. Well, that certainly doesn't make any sense. Like I said, it's complicated. The number of actual players in this particular game is quite small. This particular game? Nine. That's right. Nine. Rabbits. You're better informed than, than I'd imagine you'd be at this stage. At what stage? At the beginning. So what's this rabbits all about? That's a tough one, I'm afraid, and I don't have much time at the moment. Okay, so why'd you send that photo of Yumiko to me? And how did you know it was her? I sent you that picture because I didn't, well, don't, want to see your friend lost. It makes you wonder why, what, why he's concerned. Did you use her services? What do you mean? As an escort. What? No. Are you sure? 
Yes, I'm sure. Okay. Carly getting a little defensive of her friend there. I'm saying something else. Does it explain why you were following my friend? It's a start. Thanks. I guess. You're welcome. Now, tell me how you knew that it was... Yo, hang up real quick. Yeah. I called him back a few times, but there was no answer. He sent me a file, an attachment via the cat chat app. It was another PDF. This one featured two scanned pages. One page looked like it might be an early draft of a research paper or something similar. The second page was a series of escort reviews from an online forum. The document that looked like some kind of research paper appeared to be connected to rabbits. The language was similar to Dr. Prescott's competition manifesto. The escort reviews were harder to parse. I had no idea if one of them was supposed to be Yumiko. And this is kind of cool because it goes through all the rudimentary type investigation you have to do before you get up to the big reveal. I'll have more on that list of reviews and the other documents soon. And, of course, I'm going to upload copies of both PDF files to the notes section of our website. In the meantime, I took a trip to the Burke Natural History Museum to follow up on Yumiko borrowing Harper's membership card. I asked the museum's director who and what the police had been interested in talking to and looking at when they'd come around asking questions about Yumiko earlier. Uh, well, sure. Uh, it was just one detective. She wanted to talk to anyone who was working that day. And this is kind of cool. Because this theme of things not being where they're supposed to be or the anachronisms that pop up from time to time so yeah you may this is this is this is one of the really cool features anyone who had seen or, or spoken with the missing girl your, your friend that's museum director ron polinick he's willow thin with gold wire rimmed glasses and beige corduroy pants the woman at the front desk told me that the detective spent most of her time here speaking with you that's correct yes and why is that uh, because I'm the only one who spoke with her. You're your friend. I'm just going to show you a picture, if you don't mind confirming if it was Yumiko. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah, that's her. Although her hair was different. Uh, part of it was braided around the back. And what did you two talk about? Well, she did the talking mostly. She wanted to know how long a certain exhibit had been in place. Do you mind showing me that exhibit? No problem. Thanks. He walked me through the museum and stopped when we reached the bird section. He gently sat the object of Yumiko's quest down onto the table. It's a passenger pigeon. I'm afraid I don't know much about them, except that they're extinct, right? Right, right. The passenger pigeon was, at one time, the most abundant bird in North America. There were billions of them. One flock that passed through Ontario in 1866 was estimated at three and a half million pigeons. They completely blocked out the sun. It took 14 hours to pass. Wow. Yeah. And they went from billions to extinct in under 50 years. The last survivors of the species, George and Martha, died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1910 and 1914, respectively. That's so sad. It certainly is. This particular bird, is one of just about 1,500 specimens left on Earth. Can I touch its feathers? Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the oil on your, on your hands. Of course, I understand. Um, what's that tag? Oh, it's informational. It's a description of the state of the specimen and the catalog number. Catalog number 6878. Right. Did you Miko ask about anything else? Nope. Like I told the detective, she only looked at the birds, the passenger pigeon display specifically. Okay. Did the detective seem overly concerned about finding my friend? Sure. I mean, she seemed competent, if that's what you're asking. I'm wondering if there was a sense of urgency. Well, when I asked about the circumstances surrounding the young woman's disappearance, the detective did mention that your friend was an adult and quite easily could have taken off on her own accord. She used those words. 
quite easily. Yes, I think she did. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think that will be a good place to call this video good. Um, we're starting to get deeper into the story. I mean, even two episodes in, we're starting... We're starting to get to the second layer. The first episode was the first layer. And this one, we're starting to get into the meat and potatoes of the game. We're, start, we're just on that outer edge of that second layer beginning to drive in. Um, Cosernicus Jones is one of those characters that you like despite him despite him being a bit of a butthole and there's just he's just he's kind of helping Curly but at the same time he's got his own agenda going on so that's where I'm going to leave this until next time peace